Um, so, Dashiell Hammett. Um, can, I, can I ask just first of all, uh, how many of you have read Red Harvest? Okay, that's good, most of you, great. So, so I, I, uh, I can't like lie to you and tell you that it's a happy Christmas tale about <laughs> bunny rabbits or something like that. Um, uh, so I want to I want to start by uh, providing some contexts for thinking about uh, Red Harvest, and uh, and then I would like to uh, hear what you know what questions or thoughts you all have about the, the book as well or about Dashiell Hammett. Um, uh, so as Catherine said, uh, Dashiell Hammett was born in uh, Maryland. Uh, and in fact, he's, he's buried nearby, too. He's buried in Arlington. Uh, uh, he was born in 1894 and died in 1961. Uh, and he left school when he was a teenager. He worked at various odd jobs at that point, and finally settled into being an operative for the Pinkerton Detective Agency. Uh, starting in about 1915, and he worked for them uh, with a break for World War I, uh, from 15 to about 1921. Uh, the Pinkerton Detective Agency, if you don't know, was, was uh, a very large uh, detective agency. It wasn't like, you know, you know, one of those ones, it wasn't like a private eye kind of agency like you run into in the noir books. Uh, with just like one guy in a CD office. Uh, it was a large operation, uh, and uh, it, is, it is actually from the Pinkertons that we get the term private eye because their symbol was the unblinking eye, uh, and, and so it came from that. Uh, he worked for them, uh, uh, did a lot of jobs tailing people, uh, you know, and, uh, uh, and you know, doing doing you know so working on crimes, but uh, but eventually, as the teens wore on, the Pinkertons were employed more and more as strike breakers. Uh, so they would be called in when there was a strike to bust heads. Uh, so they, uh, hi guys. So they, uh, uh, because of that. Hammett ultimately became disillusioned with working for the Pinkertons. He, he didn't think that was uh, uh, moral, and so he uh, eventually left. Uh, he, uh, by the time he left, uh, he was not in good health. Uh, during World War I, he had contracted uh, tuberculosis. Uh, he was already uh, an alcoholic by this point and continued to be throughout his life. Uh, and, uh, and in just just a few years later, he would contract emphysema, uh, so he was often in ill health throughout his life. Uh, he started writing uh, Pulp Fiction in the early 20s. His first story was published in the magazine Black Mask in 1922. Uh, and then he had this very strange writing career. Uh, he, he wrote stories throughout the 20s, uh, and then published his first uh, novel, Red Harvest, in 1929. It was serialized in Black Mass before that in 1927-28. Uh, uh, and, uh, and he then published in very quick succession four novels. Uh, the other ones are The Dame Curse, uh, The Maltese Falcon, The Glass Key, uh, in, in that first burst of writing. Uh, he wrote those four novels all between uh, 1927 and 1931. So, so four novels very quickly. Uh, then he wrote The Thin Man uh, a couple years later in 1934. And then nothing. He never published another, another thing after 1934. Uh, and as I said, he, he lived until 1961. Um, and uh, no one actually has any answer to why that was the case. Writer's block, ill health, alcoholism, uh, you know, but he, uh, he managed to do a number of other things uh, during those years. Um, 
he, uh, he moved from San Francisco, where he had lived in the 20s, to uh, New York City in 1929, and, and spent most of the 30s sort of moving back and forth between New York and uh, Hollywood, where he was sometimes employed as a screenwriter, along with uh, a lot of other writers of the time. You probably know that people like uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald and William Faulkner and Raymond Chandler were, uh, were also employed in Hollywood. Uh, it was around this time that he met Lillian Hellman, uh, a, who, who later became a, a quite well-known playwright. Uh, they fell in love. They, never, they were never married, but they had a, uh, an ongoing relationship until he died. Um, uh, he, was, uh, uh, he was also uh, a, a drinking buddy of William Faulkner's whenever the two of them found themselves uh, together at a party or uh, in Hollywood somewhere. Uh, they, you know, it, was, it was a meeting of alcoholics. Uh, and they uh, and, and they got along very well. Um, I mention this because I, you know, in a former life I was a Faulkner scholar, so uh, uh, so, so this is this brings together those two things for me. Um, in the 1930s, Hammett became uh, gradually more and more uh, active in socialist uh, and communist causes. Uh, with the money that he was making from movie sales, he was contributing about a thousand dollars a year to the Communist Party. Uh, he uh, became a leading figure in the Screenwriting Guild, uh, organizing for recognition and for wages. Uh, he, uh, he spoke at rallies for communism. He spoke against fascism, against uh, racism and anti-Semitism. Uh, became president of the Civil Rights Congress. Uh, when uh, World War II began shortly after the attack on Pearl Harbor, uh, he signed up to join the Army uh, and amazingly uh, managed to get in, given the fact that he was, uh, you know, that he had tuberculosis uh, and that he was a communist. Uh, but, but, uh, but I guess he had, had friends uh, we'd get him in, um, uh, but he he spent the war uh, uh, editing, editing a newspaper, so it wasn't like super hard duty. But but it was in the Aleutian Islands, uh, and, uh, and I believe this is when he first contracted emphysema. Uh, in 1951, he was put in jail for six months for refusing to testify about his subversive alliances. Uh, and then in 1953, he was brought before the House Un-American Activities Committee. Uh, both times, he refused to answer questions. And uh, unlike a lot of people from this time, he was quite unrepentant about his, uh, about his communist beliefs. He, he stood by them uh, and never had any interest in recanting. Um, so. Uh, I think those are some of the important facts about uh, Hammett's biography. Uh, it's also useful when thinking about Hammett to think about uh, this term, hard-boiled fiction. Um, and uh, I suspect you've probably run into this term somewhere before. Uh, hard-boiled fiction is, uh, is, is, describes a school of writing that was uh, popular in the 20s, 30s, and the 40s. Um, my students. Um, uh, he, they, they're not allowed to do that when I actually have class. Um, uh, and the, the hard-boiled school of writing uh, is usually identified, these days at least, with three writers, uh, Hammett, the first, uh, James M. Cain, and uh, who's the author of like The Postman Always Rings Twice, and uh, Mildred Pierce, uh, Double Indemnity, uh, and then uh, Raymond Chandler, the author of The Big Sleep, uh, The Long Goodbye, the whole series of, uh, of classic uh, detective novels starring Philip Marlowe. Um, and the hard-boiled school really begins with, uh, with the pulps. Right. That is to say, pulp fiction uh, gets its name 
from the magazines in which it was published. Uh, and the reason they were called pulps is because the quality of the paper was that bad. Right? It, was, it was pulpy, uneven paper. Uh, and there was a kind of a, uh, there was a kind of a battle uh, that, that went on for a while. Uh, there was competition between the pulps on the one hand and the slicks. Uh, and those were the, the slick, glossy uh, magazines where they actually had nice paper that they were published on and therefore they were held in contempt by the writers uh, who wrote for the pulps. Uh, the most famous of the pulps was Black Mass, uh, and this is the magazine where uh, many writers got their start. It wasn't the first place that Hammett published, but it was the place where he published the most, uh, and then it later became a jumping off point for uh, all manner of other writers, uh, including Chandler and uh, Earl Stanley Gardner and uh, that whole crew. Um, and it's, it's also, I think, useful when, when thinking about the hard-boiled school uh, to see the way in which, in which it is interested in differentiating itself from the literary fiction that is being published at the time. Uh, you know, because this, of course, the 20s and 30s, is the era of literary modernism. Uh, so it, it's the era when, when uh, you know, what is, what is you know, treated as literature uh, is, are, are these quite difficult works uh, by people like T.S. Eliot, uh, Virginia Woolf, William Faulkner, James Joyce. Uh, if you have ever read anything by any of those authors, then you know that it's not the easiest reading you've ever come across. Uh, modernism is, uh, is difficult, uh, self-consciously literary, uh, and, and defines itself largely against uh, the popular culture of the time. Uh, whereas the hard-boiled fiction of the pulp writers uh, has this interesting quality where, uh, where they seem to hate literary modernism and the popular culture equally. Uh, and they have a kind of plague on both your houses uh, philosophy uh, in which they try to set up a middle ground that is separate from either of those things and is not just the middle point of them either, that, that is not middle brow. Um, so the, the, the writers of this time, uh, and, and the, the pulp writers, the hard-boiled writers, are almost exclusively men. Uh, and so what they try to imagine for themselves is, is a, a literary space that is, uh, that is not about a kind of effete, uh, production of literary fiction, but which is which is the the place where uh, where men can work as craftsmen. Uh, so they think of themselves almost as artisans, uh, rather than uh, rather than as like you know cheap purveyors of popular fluff or uh, effete producers of literary uh, of of literature. Uh, you know, held in contempt because it is insufficiently macho. Um, so this, uh, in this, in this space, we find uh, we find a number of writers grouped. Uh, the two writers who I think define what we think of as hard-boiled fiction, or what is sometimes called noir fiction, uh, are really Hammett and Chandler, uh, and. Uh, has anyone here read any Raymond Chandler by any chance? Okay, a number. Um, and uh, if you have, if you have read Chandler, uh, you know, then then you'll you'll know immediately what I'm talking about. Uh, if you haven't, you've probably run into some parodic version of Raymond Chandler somewhere along the line. You know, whether it was in a Bugs Bunny cartoon or on a TV show or uh, in, a, in another kind of movie uh, because, uh, because his uh, Philip Marlowe stories have really become iconic and representative of how we think about what is, hard, what is the hard-boiled school, what is detective fiction. 
Um, and, uh, and, and so one of the defining features of Chandler's fiction is, that, uh, is, is the way he uses metaphor and simile. Uh, that is to say, he has these, these famously bizarre metaphors and similes that he uses. Um, you know, so uh, a person you know, who, is on, who is in the wrong neighborhood is described as standing out like a tarantula on a slice of angel food cake. Um, you know, or uh, General Sternwood in the, uh, in the Big Sleep, who is old and sick, is described as using his voice as carefully as an out-of-work showgirl uses her last good pair of stockings. Uh, so so there, is, there is this kind of elaborate uh, use of metaphor in, in Chandler, and, and kind of comical use of metaphor as well, right? We all, when we run into these metaphors, we all sort of like find them, uh, you know, so outrageous that they, that they can be entertaining and therefore easily parodied. Um, I just realized I forgot to put a timepiece up here. So at some point, I'll, oh wait, I've got a clock, never mind. Uh, so, if, so I'll know if I'm like talking for too long. Um, uh, and Hammett, on the other hand, is, is, is far on the other side of the spectrum. Uh, there is, uh, almost no metaphor or simile in his works. Uh, things are described in, in, you know, in this very flat, uh, you know, way that is that is, you know, unadorned, uh, that is, uh, you know, often kind of harsh and ugly, uh, and and in which we, in which nothing is ever compared to anything else. In in Hammett, things are just things. Am I doing terrible things back there, by the way? Okay, all right. I, I, he's videotaping, so I, uh, I'm afraid that I'm like doing something weird. Um, are you raising a hand or just like, okay. Uh, sorry, teacher instincts. Um, and, uh, and so the, the other thing I wanted to say about, uh, about the kind of cultural status of these hard-boiled writers is that the interesting thing is that, that although in their time uh, they were considered you know, to be pulp fiction, not to be, uh, not to be high culture, um, now we get things like this, right? So we get, we get these nicely bound uh, you know, books that look like, look like they should sit on a, uh, uh, you know, sit, sit in, a, in, in someone's private library somewhere. Um, which I'm sure is where Julia keeps this book that I stole from her. Um, you know, or we get these, you know, these, uh, you know, nice uh, paperback versions, you know, with, uh, with carefully designed covers. Uh, and, uh, and Hammett and Chandler and the other hardboiled writers are treated essentially as literature. So their cultural status has, uh, has changed over time, you know, to the point where you can get them in a series on books that shaped America. Uh, you know, I mean, in the case of Hammett, maybe it should be like books that shaped America for better or worse. <laughs> um, I feel like I had another thing I wanted to say and I've forgotten it. But uh, in any case, uh, if, uh, if Red Harvest uh, has shaped America, uh, one of, or, or shaped the world, uh, then certainly one of the places where it has done this is in its cinematic afterlives. Uh, and there have been a remarkable number of films made uh, that are based in some way on Red Harvest. It can be a little hard to tell sometimes whether it's just Red Harvest because uh, of Hammett's three great books, uh, this one, the Maltese Falcon and the Glass Key, uh, they all share uh, an, an essential structural similarity, right? They're all about uh, central male characters who spend the book manipulating uh, sides in some kind of larger war or conflict uh, that is going on around them in order to, uh, you know, in order to achieve their ends. Uh, all three books do this. So, so it can be a little hard to separate out what's influencing what. But, uh, but I wanted to say uh, 
that one of the interesting things about the cinematic versions of this Hammett plot uh, is, is that it, it crosses all kinds of genres uh, in cinema. There is a, uh, there was a straight adaptation of Red Harvest that was called uh, Roadhouse Nights, came out in 1930, which I have not seen. Um, but then, uh, then the better known versions, uh, uh, in 1961, uh, Akira Kurosawa made a film called Yojimbo, uh, in which he takes the plot of Red Harvest, essentially, and makes it into a samurai movie. Uh, that was remade then as a Western by Sergio Leone, uh, A Fistful of Dollars from 1964, uh, in which, uh, you know, another man with no name comes to a town and, uh, and causes havoc. Uh, it was then uh, it was then later made as a as a gangster film, uh, Last Man Standing from 1996. Uh, it was made as a fantasy movie in uh, 1984 called The Warrior and the Sorceress. I have to admit I also have not seen that one. Um, and it was made as a as a high school film uh, in in 2005 called Brick. Uh, I don't know if anyone has seen Brick, but, but it's, it's, it's Dashiell Hammett set in a high school. Um, and, uh, and I wanted to mention that there are also uh, uh, the, you know, the, the contemporary filmmakers who have shown the most interest in, in Hammett are the Coen brothers. Good timing, right? Um, uh, their, uh, their first film was called Blood Simple a phrase that is taken directly from Red Harvest. Uh, and this film, Miller's Crossing, from 1990, uh, is, you know, it takes elements from Red Harvest and the glass key and kind of mashes them up and, and makes them into, uh, into this new plot. Um, and uh, uh, if you've seen Miller's Crossing, you may have noticed that, that, uh, that the, the line that everybody says, that, that each character says to the others is a way of greeting is, what's the rumpus? Which is also taken uh, from Red Harvest, even though it's only used once in the book. Uh, so I wanted to, to just show one scene from the film. And I, it looks like I've even got it queued up, so great. Um, and uh, this, is, this is a scene in which the character who here is standing in for the Continental Op is, uh, uh, and, and his name is Tom played by Gabriel Byrne. He's a lot better looking than the op is. Uh, he, uh, he's having a meeting with, with one of the crime lords uh, who runs this unnamed city that, uh, that he lives in. And, uh, and he, he's, he's offered himself as a kind of advisor to this guy. Uh, but in fact, what he's doing is very much like what the Continental Op does, which is figuring out how to play everybody against everybody else uh, so that they all destroy each other. Uh, so... So is this from Miller's Crossing? So this is from Miller's Crossing, yes. say that, and I don't like people who do. Mank was robbing me right along with the schmatter. What convinced you of that? Mank Leroy took a powder. We can't find him. The Dane is making excuses for him. But personally, I think he was right. I think that Mank and Bernie was in it together. I think that Mank heard that you bumped the schmatter and, and lit out. You lousy son of a bitch. I told you so. 
What? <laughs> you got a lip on you. Hi. It's all right. I don't generally care for it, but that's all right. <laughs> it was a good sport to bump the schmatter. How do you know Mink skipped? Because the Dane can't find him. So he says. Meaning what, exactly? Maybe nothing. I didn't give it much thought until now, since a guy will pretty much say anything when his number is up. But uh, just before I bumped Bernie, he swore to me that Eddie Dane and Mink were setting them up. They were the ones who sold out your fix. Well, uh, like you say, a uh, guy will say anything. So why isn't Eddie Dan here? Well, he don't care for your kids. Maybe it's only fair to tell you. After you left us, he tried to sell me on a double cross. He says to me, why don't we double cross you and give you the bump after we get the schmatter? Well, I figure a deal's a deal. <laughs> You're square with me. You bump the schmatter, I hold up my end. Question that ethics. Everything about the war. So everybody knows who's a friend, who's an enemy. So the Dane doesn't like you. But he wouldn't cross me. We go back. Of course, there's always that wild card when... Uh... Love is involved. I know Mink is Eddie Dane's boy. But still, I... I don't make it that way. And there's nothing to worry about. Yeah. Papa, Papa, I got a prize from the scissors! Papa, Papa, I got a prize from the scissors! Papa, Papa, I got a prize from the scissors! Yeah, just a minute. Of course, then there's no... Papa, Papa, I got a prize! Shut up! You take a page out of this guy's book. I'll let him last you talk. I'll let him more you think. <laughs> Kids, you gotta be firm. Anyways, there's no reason not to check things out. If Mick is around, I want you to find him. He can tell us what's what. What's the matter? Somebody hit you. What's the matter? Aren't we friends anymore? If you find him, I want to talk to him alone. That's the way you get the straight to straight up, man to man. Just me, Mink, my friend Roscoe. You understand what I'm saying? And then complicate. Okay. Thank you, man. Um, so, uh, you know, if you want, we can we can talk more about that at some point. I, I also wanted to read uh, just a little excerpt from the, uh, from the movie, uh, rather than showing the scene, uh, which it seems to me speaks to, uh, to the way in which it uses Hammett. Um, and in, in, in this scene from the movie, uh, Tom, the character we just saw, Gabriel Byrne, uh, is in bed with uh, Verna, uh, who, it's complicated, but you know, they're having an affair. Um, and uh, and he says, there's a dream I had once. I was walking in the woods, don't know why. The wind came up and blew my hat off. Verna says, and you chased it, right? You ran and ran and finally caught up to it and picked it up, but it wasn't a hat anymore. It had changed into something else, something wonderful. And Tom says, no, it stayed a hat. Uh, and, and that, it seems to me, is the, the impulse that we get very often in, in Hammett is the impulse to resist, uh, the impulse to resist uh, allowing one thing to be represented as another thing or to be transformed into another thing. Things are things in Hammett, uh, and, they are, and they are never anything other than what they are, uh, because it's confusing enough even that way. Um, Okay, so a couple of things. I, I apologize. I was going to write a list of the characters on the board before uh, before we started this, and I forgot. <laughs> so sorry about that. There are a whole bunch of characters in the book, and it's easy to get them mixed up. Uh, but of course, the most important character is the main character, the detective, the Continental Op, uh, so called because he is never given a name by Hammett. 
uh, and because he is an operative for the Continental Detective Agency, which clearly is a stand-in for the Pinkertons. Um, he uh, was used by Hammett as the central character in two of his novels, this one in The Dame Curse, and in many of his stories. Uh, and so, so in, in a lot of ways, the op is, is the original uh, hard-boiled detective. Uh, he is tough, he is overweight, he's alcoholic. Uh, to judge by Red Harvest, his diet is extremely disturbing. Uh, I'm, uh, it's hard not to be concerned about his health. Uh, uh, and also smart. Uh, the, th this, is, this is one other key thing to keep in mind about the hard-boiled detective school is that uh, it needs to be distinguished from the tradition of detective fiction that goes before and that we're probably all most familiar with from Sherlock Holmes, uh, from, from Arthur Conan Doyle. Uh, that is to say, the, the analytic tradition in, in detective fiction, which is largely, although not, not exclusively, English, uh, is one in which, uh, in which we have detectives who, uh, who solve crimes uh, by thinking about them. And by and by and by looking closely at, at, at things in the case of Sherlock Holmes, uh, it's a tradition that that most people think starts with Edgar Allan Poe with his stories like the Purloined Letter and the Murders of the Rue Morgue, uh, and and Poe's detective, whose name is uh, Dupin, is uh, is is purely uh, analytical in his processes. He solves mysteries while never ever leaving the room that he's sitting in. Right? He just he solves mysteries by thinking them through, rationally. Uh, and uh, in the case of Sherlock Holmes, we get a detective who goes out and you know uh, and looks looks through his iconic magnifying glass, right? Because he looks at the details, and then he solves the mystery that way. In analytical detective fiction, uh, we have some kind of crime that is committed, and and then that crime is investigated by the detective and then gets put back in a box, right? It, so, so the detective finds the, uh, the criminal or criminals and in the process of finding them uh, heals over the tear that has been made in the social fabric by this violation of the law. Um, but in hard-boiled detective fiction, we get something very different, uh, uh, so, something that is, that is really more political. Uh, and in, in hard-boiled detective fiction, uh, the detectives, uh, for one thing, are, are much more likely to be getting into fist fights, uh, which very rarely happens with, you know, in, in, with Sherlock Holmes, occasionally there'll be a scuffle, right? And that's about as violent as things get in Sherlock Holmes uh, in his personal life. Uh, and in, but in the hard-boiled novels, there are, there are people with guns shooting each other, uh, the detective is often getting beaten up. In fact, it's really not a hard-boiled detective novel until the detective has been beat up at least once, preferably knocked out and had some weird hallucinations. Um, the, uh, the, and, and, and so uh, the way in which crime is represented in these books is also different. Uh, the hard-boiled detective takes on a case, maybe it's a murder, and usually it's a murder, sometimes it might be, be something else, a kidnapping, say. Uh, and in the process of investigating that initial crime, discovers that it is linked to other kinds of crime. And this is what we get in, in Red Harvest, right, which begins with the death of Donald Wilson, uh, but the death of Donald Wilson turns out to be connected to the corruption of Poisonville, generally. Um, so, so that, so that uh, there, there, is, uh, there is almost always in hard-boiled detective fiction and in the film noir that emerges from it, uh, an investigation not only of a, a, of a particular crime but also of the society within which that crime has been allowed to exist and flourish. Um, so, uh, Let me just uh, start then uh, by reading the first paragraph of Red Harvest, and then uh, uh, you know I will 
I will offer not a true plot summary because trying to summarize the whole plot of Red Harvest would get really, really complicated and I would just get tied up in knots up here. Um, but, uh, but a very basic summary for those of you who haven't read the book. Uh, so, first paragraph. I first heard Personville called Poisonville by a red-haired mucker named Hickey Dewey in the big shop in Butte. He also called his shirt a shoy. I didn't think anything of what he'd done to the city's name. Later, I heard men who could manage their R's give it the same pronunciation. I still didn't see anything in it but the meaningless sort of humor that used to make Richard Snary the thieves' word for dictionary. A few years later, I went to Personville and learned better. So, the, uh, the story of Red Harvest, uh, this, this continental operative has been called to the city of uh, Personville uh, by a, a newspaper editor named Donald Wilson. He goes there, uh, and uh, shortly after his arrival, before he even meets him, this Donald Wilson is murdered. Uh, he very quickly learns that Personville is run by uh, a, or had, has, has at least in the past been run by this old guy named Elihu, Wil uh, Elihu Wilson, who is the father of Donald Wilson, uh, and that, uh, and that, you know, in the, in the process of, uh, of uh, breaking up some, uh, the, the strikes that were uh, being held by his uh, employees in the town, uh, he's had to give some of his power to other uh, kind of, other factions, other people in the town who have now become crime lords, uh, you know, uh, bootleggers, uh, gamblers of one sort or another. Uh, so, so the situation in, in Personville or Poisonville is that we've got uh, several different crime factions who are all basically working together. Who are all, you know, no, no one has absolute power, but, but they're all existing in, in a kind of tense harmony. And the, uh, and the op, uh, uh, who uh, shortly after he's arrived, uh, has the, the, the chief of police has tried to have him killed uh, at least once, maybe twice, uh, decides that he doesn't like Poisonville. He's, that, that, he, that he's, um, he's annoyed by Poisonville and that he is going to do everything in his power to destroy it and to destroy all the people who have power. And so out of sheer meanness, uh, he, he sets out to play the different factions against each other and to, uh, and to get as many of them killed as possible. I think that's a reasonable summary of the, of the book. Uh, oh, and he succeeds. Uh, and, uh, and, and then, you know, the, the book more or less ends with, you know, the, with the poison bill strewn with corpses and, uh, and the op walking away. So, uh, so I'm curious, uh, questions about any of this or thoughts about any of this? Uh, is there anything that, uh, that you'd like to bring to the conversation, or, uh, or you know, why are you here? Why are you interested in what? What kind of person are you that you're interested in this book? I'd like to know, really. Uh, what's wrong with all of us? Yeah. Uh, you say you have a former life as a Faulknerian scholar, and I know that to be true. Uh, if you, uh, one question I have is why you're no longer a Faulknerian scholar. What, what has changed in the literary canon? But if you were still I, I really am still a Faulkner scholar. Yeah. <laughs> I just, I'm just not publishing anything, so. But so that the supply and demand at American University requires you to concentrate on what you're concentrating now, then? Uh, no, actually. Uh, you know, honestly, it, it's, it's not really supply and demand or, or the changes in the profession or anything. It's just uh, me, uh, you know, being unable to focus on one thing for very long, so whenever I write a new book, I want it to be on something different. So if you were still being Faulknerian, you probably would be talking about, as far as literary style, you'd be talking about Hemingway and Dos Passos as being emblematic of this kind of writing. 
You mean comparable to yeah. to the hard boiled writers? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I mean, it's it's uh, um, uh, it, it's it's interesting, you know, that that modernism is so it, you know is often so much about uh, the interior life, right? So 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 modernist writers like Joyce and Faulkner and Wolfe, uh, you know, are all interested in uh, in the rich interior life of the uh, of the of their characters. Right, so so that you can take, say, you know, one day in Dublin as experienced by a few unremarkable people, and make it into a, an epic novel. Uh, but uh, you know, so so uh, Hammett is obviously the opposite of that, right? He strips interiority out of his books and gives us no information, even in a first-person uh, narrated novel like this about what's going on in, in his characters' inner lives. Uh, so so within, within the world of, of modernism, yeah, probably the people we would go to would be someone like Hemingway, who's, you know, who we know, is, you know has, has a much more spare style than someone like Faulkner or, uh, or Wolf, uh, or to Dos Passos, who, who, who does his kind of experiments in um, you know, in, in a kind of a quasi journalistic mode. Is that what is that why you're thinking well, of those I guess guys? What I'm asking is, would, would it be more appropriate to say that Hemingway and those fossils have shaped America rather than Hamlet? Um, I don't know. I don't know. Um, what, more, it would be more accurate because they they're, they have been more widely read. You mean? Yeah. Maybe, maybe, uh, but the uh, but I, I think that that we can. I, I mean, I, I don't want to make an argument for Dashiell Hammett having shaped America, uh, but what I, I think what I would argue is that Hammett uh, exists in the same world as these modernist writers more than one might think at first glance. That is to say that that his writing is uh, is actually unusual and and it, it seems to me that, that it would in, that it encourages us to ask the same kinds of questions that we read that we ask when we read Hemingway or read Faulkner uh, you know as in why is this written this way what is the choice that's being made uh, in terms of how how this book is written um, I, I mean I'm, I'm curious are, were people in reading the book struck by the, the writing of it? Yes? Yes. Yeah. And it, uh, <coughs> it made me sort of laugh because it reminded me of, as a kid, watching Dragnet. <laughs> just the facts. And, yeah, just the facts. Not, you know, there's no personal development of the character. It's just, here he is, just doing this, I'm pursuing this. And so you're, it's always cut to the chase, very succinct. And how can I use this to figure out what's happening over here? Mm -hmm. um, so although, although with the opposite politics, right? With, well, yes. With, with, uh, yeah. with different, different drag, right. dragon being very right wing. Very right wing. Yeah. But, but in a sense, I mean, I could see where all these other characters we then have seen in movies and other kinds of, of uh, detective fiction have come, come mm -hmm. from. You know, so I, I saw that as why that might be on the list of the books mm -hmm. that shaped America, because it clearly shaped a a whole path. Mm -hmm. um, that terse for, style. Yes. Um, and a, and a uh, anti-hero, hero where you, you know little about him, um, and you don't really care that you don't know much about him. He's not somebody you're engaged by personally. Um, he's just there to move the plot along. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. That's right. I mean, we have no emotional connection yeah. to the op at all, right? Uh, you really didn't care. You're, con you're sort of reminded every now and then of how little he cares because people he's involved with, connected to, he wakes up, he may have killed this woman, he may not, he doesn't seem to be bothered particularly by the fact that she's dead, mm -hmm. uh, and that he was there when it happened or perpetrated the crime. It's just, so, he, it, it's very, it's a very cold, mm -hmm. edged uh, yep. character, more than we've had, I think. In, in yeah, a cold, cold character and, 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 you know, described in a cold way. Yeah. Um, 
the you know I mean the language echoes that. Yeah, you know, the, well, in terms of Hans' influence on American culture, I think a lot of it was really from the films that he made, or the films that were made from his work, because those were very iconic films at a time when films were a very iconic part of American entertainment. Nick and Nora Charles, um, even mm -hmm. even the dog. Aska. <laughs> um, Aska, right. Um, and I'm wondering if you could speak to uh, the fact that he may have felt represented um, artistically by those films and also compensated handsomely and okay. felt no need to, to do anything else. And really, I'm assuming that he you know, made enough money from those films that he was able to give the $1,000 to your his yep. party and do the things that he did. Do you, do you have any thoughts about that? Um, yeah, I, I mean, it, it's definitely the case that, that uh, you know, as you say, um, The Thin Man uh, and its sequels uh, may, you know, were enormously popular and, uh, and made, made Hammett a lot of money. Uh, you know, he, I mean, he made money from, from book sales and from, uh, you know, script sales as well. Um, uh, but, you know, but I don't, think, I don't think that's the reason why he didn't write anymore. Uh, my my sense is is that he really would have been happier if he had been publishing. Not not that he was just sitting, you know, like all right, now I can sit around and eat bonbons and drink champagne. Um, you know, it was uh, you know my my sense is that he was bitter actually about about not being productive as writers generally are. Um, you know, and that uh, you know as with. Uh, you know, like Faulkner, for instance, you know, he was, he was one of these people who drank, uh, you know, to wild excess when he was not writing. When he was writing, he was, he was entirely focused on, on, the, on the process of, you know, producing the book, and then it would be when, the, when he didn't have anything to do that he would go on a real bender. Uh, and, and basically, he just went on a bender for the last 25 years of his life. Um, and, and made himself and Lillian Hellman totally miserable uh, as a result. Uh, I mean, he and Lillian Hellman made each other miserable. Uh, you know, uh, you know with, they were both drinking a lot. They were both having affairs with other people. Uh, you know, so, so there was a lot of drama there. Uh, yeah, you want to so um, in this edition, they state something that would seem to bridge the gap somewhat. It says, 1935, Dashiell Hammett meets Richard Stein who greatly admires his works. Uh -huh. Is there any, uh, any more known about what she thought about his work? Did she just go, wow, yeah, great, great a, novel, or did she admire the style and the art of it? That's a good question. I, I don't know anything about what Gertrude Stein, uh, about Gertrude Stein's interactions with Hammett. Um, but, uh, but it would make sense, right? Because she was, I mean, she was a friend of Hemingway's and, you know, and admired what he was doing and, uh, and, and there, there is a lot of, you know, uh, uh, crossover between Hemingway and, and Hammett, what they do. Um, and also, uh, you know, Stein very famously uh, loved detective stories. In fact, she wrote a, an essay called Why I Love Detective Stories. And she wrote, uh, you know, a ridiculously experimental detective story uh, called, uh, I think, Blood on the Dining Room Floor. Did I get that right? <laughs> you looked like you were nodding. Um, uh, at which, uh, uh, which I have not read in a long time, uh, but I, as I recall, there was no mystery about it whatsoever, and it was all about just Gertrude Stein doing her, doing her thing. Um, yeah. I had two different thoughts. One is about the book we were talking about about his style. I don't think it's only that it's a narrative that moves along. I actually found it fascinating, even though they're hard-boiled, cold people, about the inner, about their dialogue and the back mm -hmm. and forth, and the sarcasm, mm -hmm. interrupting each other, the style. There was something that that is very, to me, American in the the 20s and 30s. And yeah. James Cagney type and all those people. Mm -hmm. It feels like his style was very entertaining, how the people beat up on each other, and he was always tougher than whoever he was talking to. But I really like that, and the nicknames they gave people. And, mm -hmm. But the other thing about it is not writing. I'm just wondering if um, he was so political and 
so concerned, plus drinking so much maybe, to block things out, that uh, I think it would be hard to write books that are this divorced from the world in terms of what was going on in the late 30s with Hitler and with communism and with all the things that were going on. If he was actually plugged into those concerns, I would think it would be really required to completely disconnect himself from the world in hmm. order to write this kind of stuff because it's completely unrelated to anything that's happening hmm. that is right. meaningful. It's a non-meaningful book. Hmm. Um. And he had meaningful concerns. I mean, even in this book, he begins with talking about the guy with the red tie and the IWW. Yeah, that's right. Which, you know, nobody knows about the IWW. <laughs> uh, well, I hope I hope someone that still knows about the Wobblies. Cover the world. And well, well, what's that? <laughs> Cover the world. And you, yeah, so, so so see, we're you know we're all we're all acquainted with the Wobblies in this room. Um, well, uh, I mean, so those those are two like really rich things. The the first one, uh, you know, is the, the the question about dialogue. So much of the energy and uh, of of these texts. Uh, both in uh, hard-boiled fiction and in film noir, comes from the comes from the, that particular sort of dialogue, um, and you know, which is which is both uh, you know both very tough and yet also uh, you know entertaining. All right, we 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 like it uh, because because it's 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 it, there's this kind of like. Uh, Verbal snappiness to it, uh, you know. I mean, as as you say, the the um, the phrases that Hammett uses are, are often very memorable. Like you know, like what's the rumpus, um, uh, you know, and uh, and also you know, there it, it's about that that you know that back and forth in which often you know what you're what you're watching is uh, you know is two characters basically kind of like slapping each other on the face going back and forth it's like i slap you you slap me back i slap you um and and the uh you know so that the violence of the books uh you know often comes as much from the way that people talk to each other as it does from what they do to each other i mean in red harvest they do some really horrible things to each other physically too but um but the uh, you know, but but that that quality uh, of the dialogue is, you know, it, it really is about like proving that you're tougher because you can say something tougher rather than that you can, you know, pull a bigger gun or something like that. Yeah. You mentioned which I had. And I'm going to come back to the second question at some point here. I don't. I don't need to cut it off. Yeah. Uh, you you had mentioned which I hadn't known that it was originally published in serialized form. Yeah. All his novels, except, except The Thin Man, were in fact serialized in Black Mask. Now, did he write it and then break it up for serialization, or was he doing it because it seems like he's constantly, for the next installation, we've got new characters thrown in, we've got new plot right. twists. I, I could sort of see every week or every month, whatever it's coming out, it's like, oh my gosh, this is going in a whole new mm -hmm. way than, than the last chapter. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, w I was saying to, to um, Julia uh, before the talk started that you know it's like when, you know at the point when Charles Proctor Dawn shows up late in the book, I was just like, really? You know, we need another plot complication at this juncture. Um, and uh, you know, and and no, I think I think he I think he did write them like section by section, especially because he was writing them so fast. You know, the, there wouldn't have been time for him to like prepare a whole novel and then. Like break it up uh, for the you know for the serialization. I, I think I, I mean I don't uh, I you know my knowledge of Hammett's biography is imperfect, but uh, uh, but that is, uh, in my sense is I don't see how he could have possibly done it that way. Because you see a character that you think is going to be important and then they're gone, kind of they sort of fade away and somebody mm -hmm. else entirely new is suddenly. That's right. That's right, and so, so in other words, it, it it does seem like a serialized book yeah. in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, one other thought that I had, by the way, about this question of uh, of, of dialogue uh, is that um, it there's there's an interesting parallel to be drawn between 
uh, between the kind of dialogue that you get in uh, uh, in hard-boiled novels and in film noir and the kind of dialogue that you get in a very different kind of genre, which is to say the screwball comedy uh, in the 1930s and 40s. Uh, you know, so that is to say they're, they're both, these are both forms that are all about, uh, all about that back and forth. In, in the screwball comedy, it's always a kind of battle of the sexes, uh, you know, we're really in love with each other, you know, kind of thing, Beatrice and Benedict from Shakespeare, that sort of relationship. Uh, where, where it's all about, uh, you know, uh, where it's all about a, a man and a woman, you know, you know, doing doing this kind of playful slapping of each other, uh, whereas it's it's done in a more serious mode in in the hard boiled form. But um, but the the structure of the dialogue is often more or less the same. Interestingly enough, um, and uh, uh, well, I, I wanted to, to jump on the on the second question about about the meaningfulness of the book. Um, you know, is it is it a book that that has meaning outside of itself, or is it is is it just a kind of like exercise in uh, just an exercise in what it does, an exercise in in tough guy talk and and uh, violent action? Um, you know, I mean, I mean, I, I'm I'm wondering to start with about about this question of of Personville and Poisonville. Um, now. Uh, I'm a literary critic, and uh, and when when you when you see something like that, and and it's the first line of a book, then you you know your your literary critic instincts uh, tell you that that that's not innocent, uh, that it, that it's not just about that it's not just the same thing as calling a shirt a shoit, um, but that but that you know there is some kind of analogy that's being drawn between person and poison. Uh, so, so I'm wondering, you know, do we get that in this book? Does, does that, does that, you know, do we see that play out? That, that people are poison? Um, it does seem like the whole town is corrupt. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I mean, do, uh, we, we certainly don't meet any, uh, any character. Do we meet any characters who are like, nice? <laughs> who we like? The wobblies. The opposite. The opposite. That's right. It, it, so, so that's the other, the other strange thing about it. Like, if if we know about Hammett, that that he has these kind of, uh, that he has these socialist beliefs, that he and 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 he is really deeply committed to the idea of like brotherhood, uh, of of like people, you know, banding together and being stronger because they band together than than an individual. Um, then why isn't Bill Quint the the labor organizer who he meets right at the beginning of the book. Why isn't Bill Quint the hero of this book? I mean, I mean, this is this is like you know the era when when there are books like that being written, right? There there are proletarian novels uh, that are being written, particularly in the 1930s, uh, a little later. Uh, you know, in which in which what we get is is like the heroism of labor, uh, and we get proletarian heroes. Uh, but uh, but Hammett. Very definitely doesn't give us that, right? I mean, he's, Bill. He's yeah. making more the point that this whole community is is so poisoned that it. Has, I mean, his goal is to bring in the National Guard. He mm -hmm. could have become corrupt, our our continental we don't know much about, and yet he has the opportunity to participate. He's offered opportunities to become rich off of buying into the corruption, but his goal seems to be to bring it all crashing down, leave it in the hands, and then he sort of leaves going, now it has a chance to start over. Mm -hmm. As if it just took pruning all of this away. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't know what his ultimate okay. point was, but it was kind of odd. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is, I agree, yeah. I think it's, it reminds me of Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, this place <laughs> is going to be wiped off, if, mm -hmm. or at least the, the, most of the people. And uh, it also made me feel as though uh, the Eden of the book is San Francisco. That's where we're going to go back to. But well, I can relate to that. Mining town in the mountains, you know, is just terrible. His only buddies, or at least one of them, are his his coworkers mm -hmm. in the agency that he can and, call on. And one of one of them gets so turns on him. <laughs> 
the event winds up not trusting him, yeah, yeah, feeling like yeah. he's he's been poisoned by poison though. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, right, right. So, uh, so, so in other words, it's it's like it's this world in which no one can trust anyone else. Uh, it, it, it's very, it, you know, it's it's, um, you know, maybe maybe then we could think of it as, in, you know, as as the uh, as the flip side of the labor as hero narrative, the flip side of the proletarian hero story, right? So instead, what we get is like, is like the dystopian vision of like what the world is like under capitalism. So, and, 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 uh, and, and the world under capitalism means everybody is radically disconnected from everybody else. Every, every, every person is only a person, right? Personville, Poisonville. And the, uh, and, and so we get, uh, we get this disconnection, right? Individu radical individualism as total dystopia. And when that, uh, and, and, and one of the other things along those lines that we get in the book is uh, is money uh, elevated to the power of everything, right? Money, money is is the thing <coughs> that motivates every person in the book. Everything and everybody in the book can be bought. You know, and and you know, along those lines, the 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 soul of the book in some. Uh, I'm sorry, the soul of the town, in some sense, is Dinah Brand, right? Because. She's the one who wants it. I'm sorry, my mic has come undone. Uh, <coughs> do I just clip this back on, or? Um, oh, God. I'm going to use the other mic anyway. So, should I take it off then? Yeah. Okay. Excellent. <coughs> um, and uh, thinking about Dinah Brown. I want the other one. Um, if you're following along in your books, this is on uh, uh, <coughs> pages 34, 35. Um, all right. So, so uh, I'll just I'll pick up with this is a conversation between Dinah and the op and. Uh, uh, and she says, what are you trying to do? Learn who killed him. Not who could have or might have, but who did. I could give you some help, she said, but there'd have to be something in it for me. Safety, I reminded her, but she shook her head. I mean, it would have to get me something in a financial way. It'd be worth something to you, and you ought to pay something, even if not a fortune. It can't be done, I grinned at her. Forget the bankroll and go in for charity. Pretend I'm Bill Quint. Um, at this point, Dan Rolfe starts up from his chair, lifts his wife to the rest of his face, he sits down again. She laughs, a lazy, good-natured laugh. He thinks I didn't make any profit out of Bill, Dan. She leaned over and put a hand on my knee. Suppose you knew, far enough ahead, that a company's employees were gonna strike and when, and then far enough ahead, when they were going to call the strike off. Could you take that info and some capital to the stock market and do yourself some good playing with the company's stock? You bet you could, she wound up triumphantly. So don't go around thinking that Bill didn't pay his way. All right, so I, I take this as, as a representative conversation with Dinah Brown, um, who, who insists that, that, that every single uh, relationship she has with everybody has to be an economic transaction. It has to be about exchange, uh, and uh, and so so we have a we have a situation in which uh, in which everybody is is an individual actor and everybody is working for money. Everybody everybody is is trying to get more money than than they give. Everybody's trying to get the best of every uh, of every transaction, and the result is. That we have a town where there is where there are no values whatsoever, 
There is no honesty, no trust, no value placed on human life. Uh, the only the only value is money. Yeah. You, so that's what you mean, though. When you say she's the soul of the town, mm -hmm. you mean that it's a mercenary soul. Yes. Yes. That's the, the essence of the town. Yeah. Do you buy that? <laughs> okay. But yeah. I think your, your point you made earlier is biographical, which I didn't know about, about his relationship <clears throat> to the Pinkertons. You could make the case that he's also writing an exaggerated grotesque of the criminality of strike breakers. Mm -hmm. And that those were the people who he got disillusioned with, and that's why he left the Pinkertons. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that this is what happens when strike breakers run amok and they are, they become uh, connected to the mafia and crime. Mm -hmm. So, so no, so if that's the case, then what do you do with the fact that the op is working for the Continental Detective well, Agency? They're a new detective agency. Oh, they're, they're different. They're better. They're better. <laughs> it's this different one. Uh -huh. I don't know. I just yeah, yeah. Thought yeah, it. yeah. No, I mean, I mean, I, I think, I think that's, so I think that's right on some level. Some problem level. he has with it himself with people who were brought in to stop a strike, and they end up. Mm -hmm. Because that is where the troubles start in right. in Personville. Uh, that's is, is you know we we begin his his entry into the town is he first meets Bill Quint and and Quint gives him the kind of like you could say it's, history. It's too extreme, but it's the cautionary tale of what happens when there are no unions. Right. That's right. Um, so so I mean I mean and within this model, if 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 uh, if we buy this this you know argument I'm making, that, that the book is a kind of like, uh, is, is a portrayal of capitalist America as dystopia, uh, then, uh, then I guess the question would be, what do we do with the op? Um, you know, how do, we, how do we account for him? Because he is, in fact, the one character in the book who is not motivated by money. He's, he's, to that extent, he's incorruptible. I mean, he's not, a, he's not a good person in the sense that he does terrible things to achieve that goal, mm -hmm. um, but he's, he's not corruptible in his mission. Mm -hmm. He set his goal and that's it. Right, right. It's not an especially noble mission. No. <laughs> uh, I mean, you can stretch it to say, yes, he's trying to purge or find out the truth, blah, blah, blah. But, yeah, I mean, he sacrifices a lot of people along the way mm -hmm. knowing they're going to get killed. So right. He's setting them up to be killed. Right. I can't remember if I marked that that passage. Um, might be on 64. Let's see. Yeah, it's on 64. Let's see. Yeah. You know, th this this is the moment when he sets out his mission, uh, and this is this is page 64, uh, where he says, "Your fat chief of police tried to assassinate me last night. I don't like that. I'm just mean enough to want to ruin him for it. Now I'm going to have my fun. I've got." 